I'd like to start by framing the issue uh, for the discussion that we want to address here tonight. As Catholics, we have day fide doctrines on the origin of man and we, that we believe are part of God's revelation. These include the historical reality of Adam and Eve and original sin. From a scientific point of view, we have two explanations for the origin of life, as you see here. On the one hand, we have evolution with the, with the theistic and atheistic versions of that. And on the other hand, we have design option where God's hand is more apparent. To the extent that these explanations actually fall within the parameters of natural science, the church has no competence to ratify the truth of either of these hypotheses. But she can point out that true natural science cannot contradict revealed truth. When we see an apparent contradiction, we have to dig deeper. Let's recall that evolutionists believe that random chance mechanisms in nature account for everything that we see. God is not needed, and they accuse Christians of positing a God of the gaps whenever they can't explain something. Creationists and intelligent design enthusiasts believe that the perfection and complexity in nature can only be explained by the existence of a designer, and Christians believe that designer is the God of creation. So what I want to demonstrate here tonight is, number one, that Catholic theology on Adam and Eve and creation is denied or ignored at our own peril. Belief in molecules to man evolution has a deleterious effect on faith and moral life. There are cavernous holes in the evolution evidence and argument, and there are more and more unanswered questions all the time about evolution theory. But the questions don't seem likely to be answered. I have often heard that evolution is not a problem for Catholics. But if this is true, one wonders why millions of Catholics have lost their faith while justifying their apostasy with evolution. And why have liberal Catholics been denying the reality of Adam and Eve for the past 40 years in public and for 100 years in private? At some point in their Catholic school education, many of my nine children have been taught that Adam and Eve are a myth and that we are all descended from multiple lines of apes. In fact, my son-in-law, sitting back there, was taught that, there, that Adam and Eve was a myth in RCIA class uh, just a few years ago before he became a Catholic. Recently, recently I took an intensive graduate course in paleontology online. <clears throat> One of the students in the course was a former Catholic and she commented on a presentation that I put together on Catholic teaching on creation. Her email said the following, I really enjoyed this presentation because I have a Catholic background, thus the reason I am the 11th child of my family. Unfortunately, the church I grew up in and Catholic schools I attended did not teach creation, but rather evolution. Go figure. I recently had one of my students who was Catholic write in an essay, I believe in evolution because I am a Catholic and Catholics believe in evolution. It was so nice to see a presentation pointing out otherwise. All right, now, <clears throat> before reviewing why the foundational doctrines surrounding Adam and Eve and creation are so crucial to believers, let's review Catholic teaching on these subjects. The following doctrines are well established in Catholic tradition and magisterial teaching. God exists and he has revealed himself. God created the world from nothing. God created, the world, uh, created a good world. God created man. In his image and likeness, man was given dominion over the rest of nature. The first human beings were innocent, happy, and holy. Now, all of mankind are descended from two original parents named Adam and Eve. Our souls, like the souls of Adam and Eve, are created instantly from nothing, and they live forever. God created Eve from the body of Adam. Adam and Eve were not subject to death or disease. Adam and Eve committed the original sin and lost those preternatural gifts. Man cannot be the result of unguided random chance as Darwinian evolution postulates. These doctrines have been taught since the beginning and most recently in Imani Generis in 1950, the credo of the people of God in 1968 by Paul VI, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1994. These are either de fide doctrines or they're taught as certain, which mean that as Catholics we are required to believe them. With the assault 
from evolutionary advocates, both from within and from outside the church, the magisterium has allowed discussion of the origin of the first man, Adam, and the length of the days of creation and the age of the earth and the date of creation. But note that I include Eve, the doctrine that Eve was derived from the body of Adam in the first list as certain doctrine of the church. Indeed, this doctrine is so strongly affirmed in magisterial teaching that it can be considered as being proposed infallibly by the universal and ordinary magisterium of the church. This is argued very convincingly by Father Brian Harrison in a technical paper and is cited that way in several well-known catechisms and repeated by the official catechism of the Catholic Church. In addition, the church has never made a definitive authoritative statement on Noah and the flood. And it seems clear that Christ, uh, but it seems clear that Christ and the New Testament writers believe the story of Noah in a literal sense. Until the advent of evolution and speculation about the time that life would take to evolve, the belief in a global flood was accepted as the best explanation for all the remains of dead creatures found in the fossil record. <clears throat> now, many believers don't care about this evolution argument. They just believe Jesus Christ and figure that whatever happened at the beginning, God made it happen. But the confusion surrounding this issue has been a root cause of the great loss of faith in recent generations and has hindered efforts by Catholics to dialogue effectively with unbelievers. While a Catholic is permitted to believe that God used evolution to create life, it is impossible for many to believe that man is descended from the animal inhabitants of a cruel world filled with death, disease, and deformities. It is equally impossible for many of the faithful to believe that God then breathed the soul into one of these animals, turning him into a human with a conscience and endowing him with the preternatural gifts of freedom from death and disease. According to this view, man did not fall down from a state of exalted holiness, but fell up into self-consciousness which some theologians even identify with the original sin. In the absence of clear direction from above, some Catholics make up their own version of what happened, when God intervened and how often he did so. Some believe in a God directed but totally natural theistic evolution, and others in a progressive creation in which God intervenes supernaturally to create new creatures intermittently over long ages. Others believe that natural evolution occurred up to a certain point at which time God turned a brute animal into a man by supernatural means. And of course, evolutionists consider all of these laughable. That word was laughable. <laughs> <clears throat> Depending on the details, it is acceptable for Catholics to hold one of these positions, but many people find these accounts less credible than the traditional doctrine of special creation, that God created the different kinds of creatures, including man by divine fiat. But confronted with this uncertainty and confusion, many simply reject Catholic teaching on creation, while others remain Catholic with a weakened faith and spiritual life. Believing that Adam and Eve are a myth certainly makes for a very confused Catholic. Once he perceives that the foundations of Christian theology are mythical, he starts to distrust the rest of the Bible. He starts to think that maybe even some of the miracles of Christ aren't true. Maybe the Bible gives an inaccurate view of the historical Jesus. Maybe Jesus didn't know who he was. Indeed, we know that all these errors are taught in many Catholic institutions today. For example, the well-known Catholic convert and Christian apologist and writer Peter Kreeft is a professor of philosophy at Catholic uh, Boston College. In his book called A Handbook of Christian Apologetics, he says, we know from our experience as professors that the demythologizers of the Bible have very effectively undermined the faith of vast numbers of young Christians. For example, we would estimate that nearly half of the students who enter Catholic colleges as believers exit as unbelievers if we define belief in New Testament terms. Pope Benedict XVI, as Cardinal Ratzinger back in 1990, <coughs> wrote a book on creation theology called In the Beginning. And uh, he addressed this issue of biblical, weak biblical exegesis. And he says therein, as far as theological views of this sort are concerned, 
Finally, quite a number of people have the abiding impression that the church's faith is like a jellyfish. No one can get a grip on it and it has no firm center. It's on, this, on these many half-hearted interpretations of biblical word, which can be found everywhere, that a sickly Christianity, which is no longer true to itself and which consequently cannot radiate encouragement and enthusiasm. It gives instead the impression of being an organization that keeps on talking, although it has nothing to say, because twisted words are not convincing and are only concerned to hide their emptiness. As a layman observing the use of scripture in Catholic Bible studies in many places and schools, this is an accurate description of the situation we faced in the church today. But I don't know if you can see my white flag there. The Pope says, no, we're not gonna wave the white flag. We're gonna fight this. Keep on fighting. In July 2005, Cardinal Christoph Schornborn, the Archbishop of Vienna, wrote an article in the New York Times entitled Finding Design in Nature. Therein he revealed his interest in intelligent design and the theological issues surrounding random evolution. A firestorm ensued and he was attacked from all sides. And we all got a glimpse of how impressive the forces in favor of the teaching of unfettered evolution really are inside and outside the church. One of Cardinal Schornborn's critics, Father George Coyne, SJ, was the director of the Vatican Observatory at the time. He is on record as saying that intelligent design belittles God. And also, get this, God himself could not know for certain that man would be the product of evolution. In his follow-up book, Chance or Purpose, Cardinal Schornborn, referring to the latter statement, said that now nonsense has taken over completely. According to speculation in the media at the time, Father Coyne was apparently encouraged to resign from his position at the Vatican Observatory as a result of his opposition to clear, clear church teaching on the subject. There is such a thing called evolutionary psychology, and it's taught at universities and is used to explain everything from rape to a four-year itch to divorce. Its declared aim, in quotes, is to provide explanations for the patterns of human activity and the forms of organization of human society which take into account the fact that humans are animals. And like all other currently living or organisms are the present day products of some four billion years of evolution." End quotes. I think that you see how problematic this can be when man is considered little more than an animal. For if evolution is true, we all have animal instincts and that makes us do primitive things that we call sin. In that case, we don't need to explain by, uh, sin by postulating an original sin. So we have a logical problem for Catholics between what natural science teaches and what the church believes. Below you will see that as the church teaches, science is our ally, not our enemy in this struggle. So what I've tried to show so far uh, is that because Catholic theology on Adam and Eve and creation is ignored or denied, Catholics are confused about evolution and are being taught error. Evolution theory leads to the idea of man as an animal who cannot help but sin. Weakened faith in the reality of Adam and Eve and original sin erodes, foundational, erodes the foundational doctrine of Western civilization, which is sin and salvation. A holistic creation theology is crucial but missing part of catechesis today. Now I'm moving on to the second part of my presentation, which is on uh, the beginnings of intelligent design. So remember that we said earlier that there are unanswered questions about evolution. In the two pillar model that I've shown here, I want to discuss the two main pillars of evolution. That is the fossil record and a mechanism for evolution that adds information. You see, we, we, see, we see what we have here is a kind of a temple of evolution. We're going to be discussing these two pillars, the fossil record and the mechanism that adds information. The foundation is natural selection, which is the survival of the fittest. Nobody argues with that. It's observed in nature. And there's also the presumption of a long age of the earth. All science talks about that. 
We're not going to talk too much about that tonight. It's part of the foundation. Um, and what we're trying to do here tonight, of course, is turn Michael Behe's irreducible complexity into something that's more, uh, more like comprehensive simplicity. So you'll see how I'm going to narrow in here on these two pillars tonight. All right, we need to uh, go over a couple definitions here so you know what the heck I'm talking about. <clears throat> the word evolution is a general term that is often misused. It can simply mean change. This evolved to that. But most commonly, it's used to mean molecules to man, evolution through natural selection and mutation. Now, macroevolution is the theory that common atoms combine to make amino acids that somehow leap across the divide from non-life to simple life to more complex life through mutation and natural selection. This is called neo-Darwinism. This is what intelligent design takes issue with, macroevolution. Not microevolution, not natural selection. Natural selection, uh, excuse me, microevolution admits to change at or below the species level. A species can adapt and vary based on its inherent designed in genetic capabilities. The variation of dog types is a common example, but that's mostly by artificial breeding. Bacteria strains that gain antibiotic resistance are another example of microevolution, all this MRSA stuff that's overcoming our, our uh, antibiotics. That's microevolution. Natural selection is the process in nature by which only the organisms best adapted to their environment tend to survive and transmit their genetic characteristics in increasing numbers to succeeding generations while those less adopted tend to be eliminated. No one denies microevolution or natural selection, even though creationists and intelligent design people are sometimes accused of that. Intelligent design, the modern intelligent design movement is led right now by the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. You can go on the on their website, and there's a tremendous amount of information there. They advance an updated version of the proof for the existence of God by design in nature, you know, Thomas Aquinas. Advocates of, in, of intelligent design show that the complex structures in the natural world strongly infer the existence of an intelligent designer rather than undirected natural processes. However, they distance themselves from Genesis so as not to look fundamentalist. In fact, intelligent design advocates tend to avoid using the word God and make their arguments palatable to modern science. Creationism, there's various shades of creationists, but today it is usually uh, means, uh, it's generally defined to mean that they believe in Genesis 1.11 as literal history, written under divine inspiration that gives a literally true account of the creation of the world uh, and its destruction by a great flood. All right, this is, <clears throat> this is what I, uh, how I like to describe a kind of an abbreviated history of intelligent design. I like to boil it down to, to um, the story of the agnostic, the evangelical, the Catholic, and the Jew. They were authors of four landmark books shedding light on the weakness of molecules to man evolution. Michael Denton published Evolution, a theory in crisis in 1985. Being an agnostic, he had no ax to grind from a religious point of view, making it easier to get his message to a larger audience. Therein, he pointed out that evolutionists believed that when they could see life at the molecular level, they were certain to find a simple mechanism for evolution. Denton shows us the opposite is true by regaling us with the complexity of life at the level of DNA and the machinery of the cell. He points out that there is no gradualism at from lower complexity to higher complexity at the molecular level. Then came along uh, Darwin on Trial in 1991, written by law professor, oh, excuse me, I'm, uh, it's, um, yeah, Darwin on Trial 1991, written by a law professor from the University of California at Berkeley, Philip Johnson. He was a thorn in the side of doctrinaire evolutionists for a number of years, debating them and meeting them on their own turf until a stroke slowed him down. Now this is a guy had no, he was a lawyer, taught law, and he could grasp these arguments and grasp this, the, the logic of all this, and he just did a great job. 
He, he is an evangelical, and he wrote four additional books in succession thereafter. Only the first book dealt with the logical, scientific objections to evolution theory. The other books were about the culture war and the impact evolution thinking has in creating a secular society. The next author of great import was Dr. Michael Behe, professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University, just up the road from here. He is the father of nine children and a Catholic. All his children have been homeschooled through to college age. His book, Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution in 1996, was named one of the 100 most important books of the 20th century. In that book, he develops and coins the concept of irreducible complexity. It is impossible to pick up anything written about intelligent design or the creation evolution debate without seeing Behe's name mentioned. However, I believe that his second book called The Edge of Evolution just a year ago, 2007, is even more important as I will discuss. Finally, we have a Jew, Dr. Lee Spetner, who is a physicist and a long time student of evolution theory. He demonstrates in his book, Not By Chance, in 1997, how statistically unlikely it is that mutation could be the mechanism for evolution. Moving on, <clears throat> let's quickly take a look at irreducible complexity. Behe uses the mousetrap as a visual image to get across the point. Note that it has five parts. If you remove one of them, you have nothing. It performs no function whatever without all five parts. Remember that evolution requires a functional mechanism that is useful that can be replicated in the next generation because it survives through the survival of the fittest, which we call natural selection. Behe goes on to explain the complexity involved in the eye, in blood clotting, the immune system, the bombardier beetle, and other complex biological mechanisms or organisms. In each case, if you remove just one vital component among many in a very complex web, you have nothing. You can't see or your arm clots or to, to a solid mass, or you die of disease before your immune system starts to work to ward off bacterial attackers. There is no reason for nature to hold on to these developing mechanisms, since they have no function. And remember that millions of mutations are required to produce them over theoretical billions of years of time. To summarize, these intelligent design original authors uh, demonstrating their books that there are many unanswered questions about evolution. The evolution mechanism is statistically improbable. And in the case of Philip Johnson, evolutionary thinking has done great harm to our culture. Now, continuing our study, we want to ask five questions. And uh, these are the first two. Why is there no evidence of intermediary creatures in the fossil record? And why do creatures found there not change over time? Number two, how can evolutionists explain the embarrassing explosion of life in the Cambrian era of the geologic record? Evolutionists have for a long time been frustrated by their inability to convince the general public that evolution is true. In fact, there was a Fox uh, survey that came out just this week. Only 24% of church-going people believe in evolution. Only 24%. Only only um, um, uh, 39% of the population, general population, believes in evolution. That's 61% rejected. They claim that evolution is indisputable and scientific fact, and they ridicule those that believe otherwise. The evolutionist's last hope lies in the fossil record, in the fields of genetics and molecular biology. They point to the fossil record and say, see, look at all those creatures that have lived and become extinct. Evolution must be true. Then they look at the genomes of creatures and they see similarities. They point to the chimp and the man and they say, look, their DNA structure is 98% the same. Wow, 98%. It must be easy for evolution to jump that gap. All we need is lots of time. So let's take a look at these branches of science and the evidence that we find there, starting with paleontology and the fossil record. As Johnson points out, most people are, una are unaware that Darwin's most formidable opponents were not clergymen, but fossil experts. One thing I do want to explain before we get, go a little deeper here is that uh, the concepts 
of evolution and the age of the Earth and the Big Bang are separate issues. There are many people who believe in a long age Earth or an ancient universe, but understand that the theory of evolution does not explain the origin of life. While we will be touching on issues involving the age of the Earth, the theory of evolution is our target here tonight. We will be searching for any evidence that evolution is true. We will not accept circumstantial evidence. Because two creatures look similar does not mean they must have evolved from something that predated them both, for example. Also, I should explain that while I refer to millions and billions of years of age, I am using the accepted scientific speculation of the day through the arguments, though the arguments for a much younger Earth are getting stronger all the time. Fossils. <clears throat> A fossil is a pre-existing organism that has been preserved and changed to stone in the geologic formations around the world by natural processes. Some fossils are known to be 1,000 to 3,000 years old, yet they have been turned to stone. There are other examples of tools and instruments left in a mine, for example, that were found 30 to 50 years later encased in stone. A key to understanding the fossil record it is, that, is that it is far from a continuous or predictable historical record. It's like a book with many pages missing and many sentences missing on each page. Fossils do not collect gradually. For example, there are, no, there are few to no fossils collected in a river delta since the organisms will decay rapidly as they are attacked by microbes in the presence of oxygen. The reason for this is that most fossils are captured and created by catastrophic events causing rapid burial. Any sediment layer where fossils are found had to be deposited quickly. Fossilization begins immediately. There are many fossils found in the act of eating, giving birth and fighting, and they are buried quickly in the act of doing these things. So here we see a fish with a, another fish in his mouth and he was buried in the act of swallowing that fish. Here we see massive dinosaur graves, and notice all the bones are, are found together. And they're found in thick layers. These didn't die one by one. They were gathered here by some catastrophic event and, and, and deposited in one location. Now Darwin knew that the fossil record was a key to, the, to the, his theory of evolution. He needed to demonstrate slow and gradual change progressing to new creatures. A key to this was to find intermediate creatures along the way. Darwin was frustrated that he could not demonstrate any of this transition in the fossil record, and he left it to future generations to find evidence that he needed. Now, in the sedimentary rock strata around the world, there is a pattern that we see repeated in many places where the fossils of former creatures are found in a somewhat predictable sequence. Each layer is called a system, and when scientists stack them up, they call it the geologic column. There are 12 major systems or periods in the geologic column. If we add the Precambrian rocks that have only a whisper of life preserved before the explosion of complex life forms in the Cambrian, we have 13 layers. A complete geologic column where the whole sequence can be seen has not been found anywhere in the world. Layers are missing in most places. Sometimes they are upside down and others pushed vertical. In the Grand Canyon, for example, we see the basement igneous rocks then the Cambrian, and uh, the next three layers are missing, representing about 150 million years. So what do we see here in, in our slide? We see uh, about 650 million years. We see that the Cambrian, the explosion of life right here at the Cambrian is about 542 million years ago, <coughs> according to uh, evolutionists. Now in the Grand Canyon, we have the Cambrian layer, then we're missing three layers and that's considered to be 150 years missing. Then we have the Mississippi and the Pennsylvania, and that's where all the coals found around the world, mostly in those two layers. Uh, and we skip one up here, we see the Triassic and the Jurassic, that's where the dinosaurs are located. Dinosaurs died out right here at 65 million years. In the Grand Canyon, we're missing these layers here, 250 million years are missing in the Grand Canyon at the top. Down here at the next layer above the Cambrian in the Grand Canyon is found a layer called the red, uh, red wall limestone. In that layer, it's about 8 to 20 feet thick, covers 5,700 square miles, four states. In that layer is buried 4 billion, 4 billion nautiloids that were buried at the same time. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a second. Here's the Grand Canyon. Uh, creationists like to call it Missionary Canyon. Evidence for catastrophic events uh, are undeniable there. And all the, the, the geologists now that have been studying the canyon for a long time, <clears throat> they now no longer talk about the little Colorado River cutting that Grand Canyon. They talk about catastrophic events and trap lakes that re release their uh, liquid down through the Grand Canyon, forming the Grand Canyon. So what's the creationist view of the geologic column? It's of initial complexity at first appearance. We expect God created life with its complexity, so we expect to find it that way, and we do. Rapid burial on a large scale, mass extinction, decline in variety, sharp boundaries, not increase in variety, decline in variety, sharp boundaries between the kinds of animals, stasis of morphology, which is body shape, in other words, the uh, non-changing body shape, and no missing links are true transitional creatures. A sequence of flood deposits, deposits based on the ecological zones where the animals lived, and index fossils related to ecological strata rather than time-age layers. The creationist view is indeed what we see in the fossil record captured in the geologic column. The evolutionist and paleontologist, well-known Stephen Jay Gould, admitted as much when he said, in honest moments, we must admit that the history of complex life is more a story of multifarious vari variation around a set of basic designs. And isn't that the way God would do it with a set of just basic designs that he, that he varied for various kinds of animals, adding and subtracting as needed? Then a saga of accumulating evidence, <clears throat> to finish that quote. Since trilobites and dinosaurs did not live together in the same environment, we would not expect to find them buried together in a catastrophic event, like Noah's flood. Vegetation that exists in the ocean or on low-lying marshes will be buried first. Mammals and birds living at high elevation and able to escape at least for a while will be found at the top of the pile, so to speak. So here's some of the evidence that we see in the fossil record. This is a favorite topic of mine, and I could go on for a long time, but we don't have time, so I just have one or two slides here. Okay, at the bottom we see the Cambrian explosion that we talked about a minute ago, where complex life births forth in the fossil record during that period. Only whispers of life, like wormholes and things like that, a jellyfish here and there, before that, and then, boom, we have the trilobite with its compact, compound, compound eye. And every creature has amazing complexity that was there from the beginning. All or most of the phyla of life are found in the Cambrian layer. No intermediates or transitional fossils. New life forms appear in the geologic column with no history or ancestors or sign of transition from one to the other. The ones that they used, to, they used in the past, like the horse series, have been abandoned. And, na and many now admit that they have fewer transitional examples now than when Darwin was alive. G.K. Chesterton was no friend of evolution. And he is quoted as saying, one thing you can say about the missing links is that they are missing. <laughs> Stasis, no change, is the rule in the fossil record. When something living today is found in the fossil record, it's virtually the same as we see today. The shark has existed for 400 million estimated years without change. Sperm whales and apes for 23 million years. Wasps, cockroaches, silverfish for 200 million years, according to evolutionary dating. Other examples include sponges, corals, spiders. Constancy of form, not transition, is the rule. The famous evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould was the first to publicly acknowledge what he called paleontology's trade secret, that there was stasis in the fossil record any time a creature could be found in successive layers. We have living fossils that we found in the Cambrian, that are found in the Cambrian layer, living fossils that still exist today that are found at the very bottom of the Cambrian layer 542 million years ago. Like the clam that you find on the beach, the brachiopod, you can always f also fi find on the, on the beach. Algae, the horseshoe crab, and jellyfish. We see evidence of massive burial. I talked about four billion nautiloids in the red wall limestone. That's what a nautiloid looks like right there. This is one of the fossils in the Grand Canyon. They cover 
and they were, they, were buried, they were buried alive because you can tell by the way they're oriented and some of them are, are turning over and they're sticking up. So you can see that there's a, you can see that there's a, 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 a flow in, in a certain direction that killed these things and entrapped them. Four billion of them killed. It's the, the kind of life that existed back then. <coughs> This is the trilobite. These things are anywhere from an inch long to about 30 inches long. And uh, they existed for their bottom dwellers, and they're found at the very bottom of the geologic column. And they, they, they were in fresh water, they were in seawater. Uh, there's trillions of these fossils are found, trillions of them. They existed for a supposedly 323 million years before they became extinct. There's a huge number of species. They had, the, they had all the physiological uh, features of, of, of life. They were very complex. They had a mouth on the bottom of their body because they were bottom feeders. And they had compound eyes that were more advanced than human eyes because they could see in the water. Uh, they, they, they don't have the parallax problem that we have in water. Very, very complex developed creature at the very bottom of the Grand Canyon. There, a lot of them look different than these, but what I did was, was trace these from all the way down to the bottom. 540 million years, you can see these are all found in the United States, these trilobites. They're basically the same creature. They're just variations of the same thing. And it lasted for all those years, 325 million years. This is called a polystrate fossil. This is a tree that's turned to stone. They're very, they're very common. They're all over. And this is supposed to leave millions of years of time here that this tree penetrates rock. So if it was sticking up in the air, of course, it would have rotted long ago. So this is a big mystery for the fact that these, uh, these um, trees exist all over the place in, in, uh, in uh, our sedimentary rock, and they span millions of years. Dinosaur flesh, about 10 years ago, a, a, a dinosaur bone that was supposed to be 65 million years old was found. It was partially turned to stone and partially still bone. And originally looked at it in the microscope, and they found what looked to be hemoglobin, or red blood cells, I guess. And uh, the further they looked, they actually found ligaments and flesh. So this has been a big controversy ever since then. How, could that, how can you explain that? How could a dinosaur be extinct for 65 million years and still have flesh and blood cells? We're going to move on now to um, our last three questions. We're going to move over to, from the fossil record to the mechanism that adds information. There are many other anomalies, of course, that we could talk about in paleontology and the fossil record. But remember that uh, we were looking for um, answers to our questions about the Cambrian explosion, stasis, and the lack of intermediary forms, and there really aren't any. So continuing our search, we have three questions. Where, where's the mechanism that adds information and complexity to form new creatures. How can even evolution, if it's true, overcome the immense amount of time required to change a monkey into a man? Is life actually developing, devolving rather than evolving? To examine these, we want to turn our attention now to the fields of genetics and molecular biology. Remember that the presiding theory of evolution depends on two things, natural selection and mutation, mutation being the mechanism that allows natural, mutation, uh, natural selection to capture uh, that change in the, in, the, uh, in the genome. Everyone agrees that natural selection is an observable mechanism in nature that leads to survival and cleanses away some bad mutations. Natural selection needs a change mechanism that can be captured by selection. And it is proposed that, that mutation is that mechanism. And that, and that is what we want to discuss tonight. There's no other way to understand mutation than to look at the molecular level. That may scare some of the more science-challenged members of our society. But in reality, the principles are not difficult to understand. Remember, we are striving for comprehensible simplicity here tonight. So we will be using information from two contemporary books to survey recent advances in molecular biology that create big problems for evolutionary theory. Of course, the books are bold challenges to that theory and are therefore very controversial. The first book is by Michael Behe, who we mentioned previously. In his second book, 
uh, entitled The Edge of Evolution. Above, we mentioned that the concepts of evolution, the age of the Earth, and the Big Bang are different arguments. His book is specifically about random mutation, as that is the only credible theory extant today that seems to supply a mechanism of change from one creature to another. The second book that will be a key reference is authored by Dr. John Sanford and is entitled Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. Sanford joined Cornell University in genetic research in 1980. He worked in plant genetics for many years and co-developed the gene gun, which shoots DNA through the cell wall of a plant. This gun was used to genetically alter corn and soybeans looking for disease resistance and other improvements. Sanford holds over 25 patents and has authored 70 scientific publications. For years, he was a practical atheist with evolution as his religion. He eventually converted to Christianity, but still believed in evolution. Gradually, he began to examine what he knew about genetics and found that rather than that the uh, biology axiom that nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution being true it was actually that nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of design remember in our last three questions here are some very key concepts that we need to keep in mind we need to find a mechanism that adds information to the genome so that a new and different creature can emerge then we need to show that the added information can truly change that creature in some reasonable amount of time With mutation being the mechanism that is postulated to have all these evolutionary powers, let's now look at mutations at the molecular level, where, where, <clears throat> where we detect the following seven observations. We see amazing complexity at a micro scale. We see three-dimensional control, overlapping genes, genes that regulate other genes and respond to environmental conditions. No mechanism that adds information to the DNA in the genome. Denton, Behe, and Sanford expose this lack of information and Lee Spetner, and not by chance, concludes that, I don't say it's impossible for a mutation to, have, to add a little information, it's just highly improbable on theoretical grounds. Number three, no gradualism of advancing complexity at the molecular level. Michael Denton makes this point very convincing in his book, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, but we don't have time to cover that here tonight. Number four, no truly beneficial mutations. A statistical improbability of useful complex mutations that is, more than one point mutation at a time. Devolution rather than evolution. We are getting weaker, not stronger. Number seven, it takes millions of years to fix a mutation in the population and 12 billion years to fix a thousand mutations. That doesn't begin to describe the amount of mutations necessary to change a monkey into man. Now, let's, ref let's go over a few definitions again. We have a cell, a very tiny structure. In every cell in our body, we have a genome. If you take that genome out, you have chromosomes. And on each leg of the chromosomes, you get half of your chromosomes from your mother and half from your father. We have the DNA structure that we can uncoil. And we uncoil it in inside. We have the two ribs of the DNA we see all the time. And inside, we have the four different types of nucleot nucleotides. Nucleotides is where mutations take place, and then we, nucleotides uh, uh, program proteins, and the proteins go out into the body and perform functions. So the genome is a set, uh, a total set of chromosomes and, and DNA, and it's a complete instruction manual for the body. 46 chromosomes, half from each uh, parent. There's about 30,000 genes in the genome. DNA is the design code of the genome. That's the uncoil, double-ribbed structure we see here. And it specifies proteins. DNA now is smaller than a speck of dust. You uncoil it, it's three feet long. And it would fill 2,000 volumes with the information that's contained therein. Remember, we said there's three billion nucleotides. That's where mutations occur. The, the nucleotide pairs, actually. There's six billion of them because there's two in each. And then proteins perform the work in the cell. If proteins misspecified by mutation, disease occurs. So we don't want mutations to occur in there because it's usually a problem. This is a, um, a guy by the name of Paul Davies. He's an evolutionist, teaches at one of the universities in Australia. Remember our question three, what's the mechanism that adds information? 
And he says here, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? Nobody knows. There's no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. Here's a little illustration. This is a word find game, an analogy. I have the word design, the word moon. And we're trying to find these words in, the, in our puzzle here. And we see design and moon both have N as the last letter. What happens if we have a misprint? We have a mistake and we put a Z in there. Chaos, right? We can't finish the game. We can't find the words. It's akin to a mutation. Here's our uh, DNA structure again. Remember we talked about the complexity. There's actually overlapping genes. It's not linear. It's actually three-dimensional. So here we have hair color and toenail they are overlapping. What happens if we put a mutation in there? We have tremendous chaos because it's affecting a lot of things in one of these nucleotides. It's not normally a good thing. It's not a good thing. Back in the 1860s, Mendel developed the basic laws of genetics. Mendel found that information existed in the genes of living organisms that allowed them to vary. Thus, we have over 200 breeds of dogs and different skins, different color skins in man. Please note that after some time, it's no longer possible to breed a large dog starting with two small dogs or a black man starting with two white parents. The information that was lost from either isolation or mutation has to be added back into the genome in order to do that. As shown in the figure here, the slide, you cannot breed large dogs from a chihuahua since too much information has been lost. And the two twin babies in the photo had light black parents, both of whom had white mothers and black fathers. Without the white grandmothers adding information back into the genome, into the genetic pool, the white twin would not be possible. Sometimes this is from mutation where information is lost and harm is done. So you see these two beautiful little twins. Those are their, their parents. They came out, one black and one white. Miniature poodles have many known genetic defects from mutations. This is just a parcel list here. Not that I want you to read it. Dogs have been shown genetically to come from wolves, which have great variety designed into their genome. But you can't start with a poodle and breed a wolf because the poodle has lost too much information in its genome from breeding. A poodle is an example uh, of devolution, not evolution. Remember, we're looking for new information. Here we see loss of information or the use of existing information. We don't see a mechanism for evolution, only the natural variation of information that exists or existed originally. No new information is being added. Now let's look a little deeper at our seven observations. Mutations are almost always negative or neutral, and they never add information, although theoretically possible. When discussing mutations, scientists always leave open the possibility that there are positive mutations out there that allow significant change. But when mutations are called beneficial, it's normally because they have allowed the mechanism to overcome a problem in its war to survive, which Behe characterizes as trench warfare. By that, Behe means that the organism accepts a weakening mutation, which burns a bridge in the war against an invading parasite, for example. That allows the mechanism, the organism, to live to fight another day, but has left him in a weakened state. Now, Behe uses the example of the malaria parasite that attacks the hemoglobin protein that you see in the slide here on the left, very complex uh, protein polymer chain, making it difficult for the parasite to enter the cell. People with sickle cell would survive malaria in Africa and pass on their genes to the next generation. This is an example of natural selection in nature. Every, eventually, people will be born from two parents, both of whom carried the sickle cell mutation, and they will develop sickle cell disease. So what do we have here? We have our hemoglobin protein. In the microscope, it looks like this, like a donut. Sickle cell is a single mutation that attacks the hemoglobin and, and deforms it. The malaria parasite can't attack that. And therefore, people with sickle cell from one parent are very resistant to uh, malaria. People with two parents that have sickle cell are totally immune <coughs> to malaria. But down here you see that our monkey here is burning this bridge. So we have the advancing malaria. He's burning this bridge. He's willing to sacrifice 
uh, a, uh, uh, a mutation that gives them sickle cell to stay alive. However, we know that the sickle cell anemia is a disease that kills its host. So, though a child born with two sickle cell carrying parents is virtually immune to malaria, they will die from sickle cell at a young age. Thus, we see that in this case, from the perspective of malaria, the sickle cell mutation is considered good, but like the burning bridge in the Bayhee Trench warfare, the mutated organism is left in a weakened state. Close to half of the population of Africa now carries the sickle cell uh, trait due to the natural selection caused by malaria. And over one million people still die from malaria every year. Now, remember the um, sickle cell was a single mutation. The sickle cell was a single mutation. Malaria parasite needed a double mutation to overcome the drug chloroquine. It took 40 years. We had a drug that, that was effective against malaria. It took 40 years for malaria to conquer that drug and make it ineffective. Double mutations are 100 times less likely than a single mutation. By a double mutation, we mean that two needed mutations appear at the same place, at the right place, at the, just the right time. In 10 million years, Behe points out that it is statistically impossible for one double mutation to have occurred in man due to the number of humans and their 10 to 20 year generational gap. Yet, for the complexity we see in nature, many double, triple, and higher level mutations must occur if evolution is true. It takes a thousand mutations to change genes significantly, enough to start to create a new creature. And it would take 12 billion years to fix those mutations in the population of every human genome. So for example, the monkey. Remember we have uh, three billion nucleotides, pairs, so that's six billion. So if the monkey is 98% the same as man in his genome, it would take 40 million mutations to turn a monkey into a man. Right? And before, in this slide, we said it, uh, you couldn't have one double mutation in 10 million years in a man. So how are we going to get 40 million mutations to turn a monkey into a man? Now, uh, John Sanford. Uh, remember the book, Genetic Entropy, and that entropy is established principle that natural systems deteriorate with time. Entropy, remember. Uh, it, entropy or disorder and chaos in the universe are always increasing. Indeed, what Sanford has discovered after reviewing his life's work in genetics is that the human genome is indeed deteriorating, not getting stronger. So what do we have here? Uh, in John Sanford's book, uh, he shows a lot of different graphs, but this is the major theme of the book. What do we see here? We see on the vertical scale the frequency of mutations, and on the horizontal scale the, the type of mutation, whether it's neutral at zero, whether it's positive to the right, it adds information, adds value, or it's negative, it deteriorates to the left. And you see what scientists have found is that most mutations are in this neutral zone, what's considered to be a neutral zone, it's their mutations in the nucleotides that do not program proteins. So most mutations that occur are either neutral or slightly negative. Now in this gray box, Sanford calls this the no selection zone. So mutations occur, they can be handed around, they can be passed around, creating a little bit of chaos here and there, but they can't become permanent residents of the genome can't become part of the genome that everybody has. Down here he shows positive mutations. He says that if I showed the true positive mutation line here, you wouldn't be able to see it on the graph. And he says if there are any positive mutations, they're immune to selection. They cannot be selected and passed on to the next generation or to become, not the next generation, but to become part of the, part of the human genome. Now the bad news is over here we have negative uh, mutations. And natural selection slows the accumulation of these harmful mutations, but they can't stop it. Natural selection cannot stop the accumulation of, ne of negative mutations in our genome. And in fact, we know that there's something like 5,000 genetic diseases identified in humans today. So Sanford concludes that this completed picture makes progressive evolution on the genomic level 
virtually impossible. Selection slows mutational generation, but does not even begin to actually stop it. So even with intense selection, evolution is going the wrong way, toward extinction. The result is that all higher genomes must clearly degenerate. So we have not found natural science answers for how information and complexity got into the genome. Nor can we find enough time for evolution to happen. Plus now we see that perhaps we are getting weaker and actually devolving. In the summer of 2006, Pope Benedict XVI, we're coming to the end, ladies, we're coming to the end, held a conference at Castle Gandolfo, his summer residence on the topic of creation and evolution. The proceedings were recently published and I personally consider them disappointing. The main speakers believed in Darwinian evolution. That's this book over here. This is the book Chance and Purpose by Cardinal Christoph Schoenbord. This is the, the uh, proceedings of the uh, conference at Castle Gandolfo. The main speakers believed in Darwinian evolution and there were no counterbalancing technical presentations. However, with the Pope and Cardinal Schoenborn in the lead, there was some good give and take. Professor Peter Schuster from the University of Vienna was a featured speaker and has written many pro-evolution articles, even arguing that Darwinian view of evolution is scientific fact. And yet, in the Q&A after his presentation, when participants were discussing the difficulty science was having in demonstrating how small random mutations could possibly be the mechanism for evolution, Schuster admitted that the accumulation of small steps could not be the mechanism for evolution. Remember now, these small steps are crucial to Darwinian evolution. That's what evo uh, Darwin believes and that's what the modern theory of evolution was, that small steps added together would change something to something else. Our Holy Father, Benedict XVI, caught on to this shift in evolutionary thinking of at least some scientists. He stated, I would like to address the leaps, which Cardinal Schornborn also spoke about. The summing up of minute steps does not suffice. There are leaps. The question of what this involves has to be examined in greater detail. The question of these leaps are now out in the open, but it's still a small crack in the dam, as is my understanding that those who would ex agree with Schuster are still a small part of a small minority. If science cannot find and show small, how small steps can build anything of significance, where are they gonna find a mechanism to explain leaps? Again, there seems to be no natural science explanation for the complexity we see in nature. And science is now quietly looking for a new mechanism that creates leaps. So our questions remain unanswered. And remember, no one has ever observed the appearance of so much as a single new organ or functional system in nature or in history. Before closing, I'd like to take a shot at answering the question about why so many people reject macroevolution. You and I know that for many, it is not because they understand the technical arguments. They reject evolution because of the amazing things they see in nature. They sense that evolutionary science has not been able to explain them. We can start with the eye and the bacterial flagellum and the bombardier beetle, which are favorite examples of many. Consider the metamorphosis of a caterpillar to the incredibly beautiful array of butterflies in the annual migration of the monarchs, or the amphibian to tadpoles to frogs. Consider the blood pressure control in the neck of a giraffe so that he can drink. For example, in the, in the slide here, you can see that uh, this, the, uh, the giraffe has a very high blood pressure. When he, if, he, if he didn't have uh, these control valves in his neck, he'd blow his brains out when he took a, a drink of water. And when he lifted his head back up, he'd faint if it wasn't for this sponge mechanism in his brain there. He'd faint from lack of, of blood. Where did this come from? One species of squirrel can hibernate and reduce its core temperature to as low as minus two degrees centigrade, where respiration and heart beat are undetectable. Brainwave activity is zero. Sperm whales have several tons of oil in their head that becomes denser with cold temperature, allowing the whale to match the density of water at colder and deeper depths for diving and hunting. Evolution cannot begin to explain where this amazing design and complexity comes from. If we had time, there are many other examples of just incredible design. 
So in conclusion, we have seen that God's creation is wonderfully amazing. We have seen that the Catholic faith has the doctrine of creation at its core and could even be called a creationist faith. Benedict XVI has called us back to an appreciation of God's intelligent design in nature. We've also seen that Catholic doctrine is difficult to reconcile with modern macroevolutionary theory. And this contradiction has led many Catholic teachers to deny de fide teachings on Adam and Eve and original sin in our schools, thus undermining the faith of our children. Our questions about evolution are still unanswered, and there are many more questions about evolution than we had time to pose tonight. But these are crucial ones. Tonight, we sifted through some of the latest scientific evidence and found that there's no evidence in the fossil record for evolution. Mutation usually causes harm to nature, rarely if ever adds information, and it cannot be the mechanism for macroevolution. Some evolutionists now admit that the summation of small mutational steps does not lead to new creatures and that most variation in nature comes from information already existing. In general, scientific advances are showing us that nature is designed, and therefore it seems that what are considered the creation myths of Genesis actually harmonize with natural and historical reality much more than many people are willing to admit. Thank you for your patience and your perseverance. <laughs>